Bien, ahora va a seguir con su experiencia y su aportación como soñadora en acción Victoria Hale. La doctora Hale reside en, esta, en San Francisco, en Estados Unidos. Es una científica, farmacéutica y emprendedora social en el campo de la salud global. Su sueño en acción es el desarrollo de nuevos medicamentos para toda la humanidad con el reto específico de reducir las desigualdades sanitarias. En el año 2000 fundó el Institute for One World Health, la primera empresa farmacéutica sin ánimo de lucro de Estados Unidos de la que es actualmente presidenta emérita. Con su liderazgo, la organización desarrolló una nueva cura para la enfermedad de la leishmaniosis visceral e introdujo una nueva manera de tratar también la diarrea deshidratante. Desarrolló una tecnología base para reducir el costo de los medicamentos para el tratamiento de la malaria más de diez veces. En el año 2008 fundó Medicines 360, una nueva forma de empresa farmacéutica, también sin ánimo de lucro, que es autosostenible gracias a los beneficios procedentes de las ventas. Victoria considera que el beneficio económico es un medio para llevar a cabo su misión, no es el principal objetivo. La doctora Hale ha sido galardonada, entre otros premios, con el Premio para la Innovación Social y Económica por la revista The Economist en 2005, la revista Glamour Magazine la, la nombró Mujer del Año en 2007, ha recibido también el Premio de Distinción de la Asociación Americana de Científicos y Científicas Americanos y recientemente ha recibido varios honores, como por ejemplo el nombramiento como miembro del Instituto de Medicina de las Academias Nacionales de Estados Unidos en 2007 y es reconocida a nivel internacional como una gran emprendedora social. Desde el primer momento en que nos acercamos a Victoria, quedamos encantadas con su fuerza y su sensibilidad porque nos dimos cuenta que habíamos conectado con una soñadora en acción muy potente. Victoria. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Yes, please. It's an honor to be here. So thank you to the organizers uh, for planning this beautiful event and inviting me to speak. And it truly is uh, a beautiful setting. Um, so I look forward as well to the day and what it will bring forth from each of us as individuals as well as us together. So I'll speak with you today about my dreams, my vision, and what I've been able to accomplish and what still remains to be accomplished. And I've done all of this work with others, sometimes in partnerships, and sometimes in intimate relationships with small groups, and sometimes in very large partnerships with corporations. But it really does take an individual dream to begin, but manifesting in action and in change in the world means going beyond that dream and engaging others as well. Our world is a turbulent place right now, some people believe. It's a bit scary to some people. Nature and the storms that occur now, rising water, our belief that climate change is severe and will go on for many years. There's also human mobilization and human protest, human discussion, in addition to what's going on in nature. The 99% coming together to speak of being the majority compared to the 1% who run corporations or control financial wealth. The Occupy movement, which occurs all over the world now, again at Wall Street, there's an Occupy San Francisco as well. Is there an Occupy Bilbao? There is an Occupy Madrid, I believe. But here we are. Um, at a time in the world when people are coming together in a very beautiful way, in an organic way, in a peaceful way, primarily. And it's a good thing. 
They're coming together because we live in a world of disparity. Disparity and inequity. And people of the world want this to end, want these disparities to be reduced. We also live in a world of separation. Separation from each other within communities, separation from each other between countries, separation from each other because of race or even because of gender. Lots of reasons to be separate. In the United States, we're separate from each other and from others because of a message from our government that we should be afraid, that fear should drive us and lead us to separation. We have, however, a beautiful, growing movement and people drawing together to elevate consciousness. And this is the theme that I'll carry through today, this hope that we can have. As Rosanna spoke earlier today, and as many of you in the room are engaged in, there is much hope for moving forward in the world, not because necessarily of the acts of corporations or our governments, but the actions and beliefs and dreams of individuals who come together. So my dream, we're at a meeting talking about dreams. My dream is within the pharmaceutical industry to create a more socially beneficial or publicly beneficial, public benefit, pharmaceutical sector. I'll tell you a little bit about my vision for that and what we've done to date and how that is proceeding. Right now in the pharmaceutical industry there is a tension, we'll call it. You see this small tugboat and this large freighter. Tension is that rope there holding a lot of pressure. There's quite a bit of tension within our world with regard to medicines between two factors. One is access, access to medicines, essential medicines, important medicines, vaccines, and incentives, incentives for corporations in particular, profit being a significant incentive. So the balance between access for more people, for all people, for essential medicines, and the incentives or the profit-making ability of corporations is what we're talking about here. And my dream is that these two not remain as tense, and these two not remain separate, but that they're brought together, that we decide that this is what the world can do, this is what this industry can do, and this sector can do, And medicines are too important to deny access to so many people, to have such disparities and inequities. Let's figure out how to blend access and incentives or profitability. This is a different type of tension. This is a good tension, a little different from a tugboat. I have three or four slides with words on them like this, so I'd like you to indulge me. We were asked very specific questions by the organizers of the meeting. And one of them is, what are the particular needs in this transformation? So here we have neglected tropical diseases. In my first organization, we developed medicines for visceral leishmaniasis. That's black fever, a human parasitic disease for malaria, you all know malaria, and cholera, or secretory diarrhea. And these are diseases of the very poorest people on the planet. And no pharmaceutical company will develop new medicines beside their very profitable medicines, right? So it's medicines for diseases of people who are very poor. In addition, there are rare and orphan diseases that we need to develop medicines for. And I'll show you a little bit about what is going on. There is a little bit of pharmaceutical engagement here, but it's because of the size of the market, 
Not that the people don't have money to pay. Often these are Europeans or Americans who have the means to pay. It's the size of the market that's small that keeps the pharmaceutical industry generally out of this sector. Next is injectable drugs, generic medicines, that we think should be available because they're not patented anymore. They should be available and inexpensive. But there are now so many generic medicines that generic pharmaceutical companies, which you know you have widely in Europe, are choosing the more profitable generics to produce. Right? So they are the lipid-lowering drugs, or blood pressure drugs, or treatments for stomach ulcers. And they're oral medicines. Okay? They're not old medicines for cancer. They're not old hospital medicines. And they're not expensive injectables. It's much easier to make a tablet than a sterile injection. So these are in short supply in the world. In addition, contraception. And one can say, we have lots of contraception in the world. What's the problem? The issue is the most effective contraceptives okay, are not a pill that you need to remember to take every day right, and a pill that's very profitable. Oral contraceptives are very profitable. But the best contraceptives, long-acting reversible contraceptives, are not being made for many, many, many people in the world. On October 31st, our global population hit 7 billion, remember? And we do not have a significant plan, nor the contraceptives in place, okay, to reduce the climb of our global population. So it's important that organizations step up to develop family planning methods that can be applied to global population as well. And that's an area that no one in the world wants to talk about. It's too hot. It's too sensitive. It's too sexual. It's too personal. So let's not be afraid to talk about it. So my experience um, in this, I can't leave this microphone right, okay. My experience, uh, this journey for me, uh, began really in 1989. I finished my PhD in pharmaceutical chemistry I was about 30 years old. I'm about 50 now. And I had a wonderful dream. I was going to develop new medicines. I went to work for the regulatory agency in the United States, the Food and Drug Administration. And I went to work there because I wanted to see an overview of how medicines are developed, not just by big pharmaceutical companies or little biotechnology companies, but by all types of organizations and companies. And it was a great experience. But I either had to move into management and administration after five years or, or leave. So I had the opportunity to go back to California to leave Washington, D.C., which was a great, great thing. I love California. Got to go back to San Francisco and work for a very um, scientifically based biotechnology company. And it was a great experience. And my career was moving very, very quickly. It was very successful. I was married. I had two children living in California and San Francisco, and my career moving beautifully, but I wasn't happy. In fact, every year that went by, I became less happy. Yeah. And I didn't know exactly why I wasn't happy. All my friends and colleagues said, you, you should be quiet. You should be very happy. You have everything. I'm jealous. I wish I had your life. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't happy. So I did something that my friends thought was crazy. I resigned from my job, and I took six months off. I'm a very hard worker, and I couldn't, while I was working, working here mostly, figure out what was going on here. Right? So I needed to take time off. So I did. And in just a few months, what easily flowed from me, just by being quiet, some meditation, a lot of contemplation, quite a bit of reading, resting. What flowed out of me was a vision of what I needed to do in the world. I love making medicines. I'm a medicine woman. I've lived past lives as a healer, and I know what I'm here to do. But I'm not here to work in a pharmaceutical industry 
that takes very good care of a few people and not very good care of many, many people. So what company was I going to work for? This was not in academia, and this was not in the government. It had to be in a company. That's where medicines are made. And that company didn't exist. So my crisis point, which was really an opportunity for growth, was to decide between two paths. One, I either choose to leave the pharmaceutical industry and stop making medicines, or I leave what I'm doing and create a pharmaceutical company that did not exist. Create a pharmaceutical company that was not driven by profits. To create a pharmaceutical company where products are made for people and the company sustains itself financially. And it's been extremely rewarding. It's been extremely challenging. Could name all sorts of emotions. Um, I'll go through a few of those here. But it has been a journey that I believe I came to this life to, to live. So I'd like to take you through it, um, through it now. So the first generation of a nonprofit pharmaceutical company is One World Health. And you heard a little bit about that this morning. We've developed medicines for the three diseases that we spoke about. We've worked as well in Chagas disease and in, uh, with a malaria vaccine. So lots of different products for tropical infectious diseases. And what we have here, is that a pointer? Yes. What we have here is a model where philanthropy comes, philanthropy comes into the organization. This was primarily funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation very generously. We do product development, drug development in this organization that's not for profit, develop new medicines, take them through regulatory approval, and then partner with pharmaceutical companies. And the partnership with pharmaceutical companies is to say, here is our baby. You develop a new medicine. For those of you who are in product development, it can be technology or energy or medicine, it's your baby. Take our baby and adopt this baby and take it out into the world. This is what our partnerships with pharmaceutical companies were about. We asked them to take this medicine to the public sector, to people with leishmaniasis, cholera, and malaria. And it worked fairly well, uh, but there was one issue, and that is that our social mission, our public mission, responsibility was given to a pharmaceutical partner. A pharmaceutical partner who is a for-profit organization, not a non-for-profit. And for-profit organizations, for-profit companies, can be responsible for a bit of public work and social mission but that's really not what they are, what they exist for. So one of the problems with this model is that the impact in the public sector did not achieve its full potential. So it is a model to consider, but it needs to be improved upon. And I would argue through this next generation of models that we are working with, still engaging pharmaceutical partners, because that's a huge engine in the world, and we don't want to say, Let's leave that engine, let's leave that energy, let's leave that force behind. Let's figure out how to bring it in to achieve further work in the public sector, but in a different way. I formed Medicines 360 in 2009 to address Millennium Development Goal number five. One of the issues for me in all of my work with One World Health was that we were treating children children of poor families. And while we were treating those children, in order to treat the children, we had to walk around their mothers. Their mothers were with them. Yeah? We walked around the mothers to get to the children. The mothers themselves often were quite sick, anemic and malnourished, often uneducated and not empowered. Right? And I, being a mother myself, I have a 19-year-old and 13-year-old, two sons, being a mother myself, I felt this is not right. It's good to work to save the lives of children, but the best way to save the lives of children is through empowering their mothers to do so, feeding them, nourishing them, giving them the tools they need, asking them which tools they need. In addition, a limitation of One World Health 
was that it was solely dependent on philanthropy. There was no other profit or revenue coming into the organization. So in the end, we were limited by the desires of the foundations that were funding us. So in order to do other work, we need to develop some freedom. As a successful entrepreneur, what's the one thing you want to do? Is have freedom to move forward into the world and do what you see next, follow your vision and your dream. So we've combined in this model a nonprofit organization with a for-profit organization to create a hybrid, sorry, a nonprofit for-profit. And we're creating that now. Let me say that that's difficult to do in the United States where there is laws, where there are laws about nonprofit organizations, charities. And then there are laws about for-profit corporations. Right? But there's very little in between. And what we're trying to do is create that space in between. It's not a nonprofit alone. It's not a for-profit alone. It combines the best of both. It combines the ideal attributes of both. And it's, it's challenging. It may be easier here in Europe, maybe in Spain. It was easier in India, let me say. So our second generation nonprofit pharmaceutical company is becoming now a hybrid entity. We founded it as a nonprofit. We are spinning out a for-profit owned subsidiary of the nonprofit, and we will partner with pharmaceutical partners. We're also developing medicines in this model that are not just for the poorest people in the world, not for diseases that are absent here, but for a condition that affects all women in the world and a very high quality product so that we can sell this medicine in the United States, in Spain, in Europe, garner those profits and bring some of those profits to apply to the public sector. So here we have similarly in this model, initial funding, also philanthropy, going on to product development and an approved medicine, and similarly, partnering with the pharmaceutical industry. Partnering with the pharmaceutical industry to supply commercial sector, private sector, Western sales. Medicines 360 retains public sector provision. Okay? And how do we do that? How do we fund that research? So we split the market into two, wealthy or insured, commercial, private, Western buyers or payers, and then public sector. The United States has more than 40 million people who do not have health insurance. It's shameful. The United States has a very large public sector and a very high unintended pregnancy rate. We're developing a contraceptive here. In addition, our product will go to developing countries. So we retain public sector provision in Medicines 360. And what allows us to do that is that we share profits that the pharmaceutical partner brings back from commercial sales. So it's sharing these profits so that this entity, Medicines 360, is self-sustaining and no longer dependent on philanthropy or initial funding. And the advantages here are the financial sustainability and control of social mission. The number of philanthropists in the world who can support work like this, development of new medicines, is very small. It's the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We have an anonymous donor. The governments of Europe, the EU, government of Spain, governments of Norway, United Kingdom, a couple other foundations. But there aren't too many. What I believe the world is really ready for, what I believe many people in the world who have quite a bit of money, who are quite wealthy in a financial way, want, is a new way to be philanthropist, is a new type of philanthropy. Is a philanthropy not where you give just to a charity, but you invest. You invest for social purposes. And you invest so that that entity will become a self-sustaining business. This, these opportunities will bring forward philanthropists who said, who say, I don't just write grants. I'll make you a loan, though. And I want my loan, my investment, to return a big social benefit. Okay? I want to make money, though. I want to do good, and I want to do well financially. So we should be creating these models, because the funding is there. 
Another element of this that is very important is that this is a social experiment. That we believe that with an elevated consciousness of society, people recognize what power they have, that they're not powerless. They don't need to be fearful. When people come together, and when there is another type of pharmaceutical company given the choice to buy your products from a company that is traditional and only for profit versus a company that makes a profit but applies that back to a social mission, that people will choose okay, to invest in a socially minded company. And then in the end, my real dream is that most of this pharmaceutical industry shift to that latter way of being. Shift to the way of being where you're not a for-profit or a non-profit. You combine both. Okay? And I believe that the biggest driver to make this happen is people. People within pharmaceutical companies who want to combine doing good with doing well, as well as people in society who want a different model, a different business to work with. There are lots of organizations in the world who have stepped up to fill what are market failures in the pharmaceutical world, to fill gaps where no one has been developing new medicines. In particular, neglected tropical disease organizations and partnerships funded by European governments and foundations and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Wellcome Trust in the UK. The same has happened with rare and orphan disease organizations in the United States and Europe. Families often come together or communities to say, let's begin to collect the research that's occurring in universities. Let's begin to develop new medicines. People are not standing still. People are not saying, I'm helpless. People are not saying, we'll just wait for pharmaceutical companies or governments to do something. People whose precious family members have rare and orphan diseases are coming together to get going in new disease research and in diseases that have nothing to do with them. They're coming together because there are huge gaps here and huge disparities that we can do something about. And it is that shift in consciousness where people come together and say, we can do this. We don't need to wait for a company. We can make this happen. We'll start it. Lots of individuals. Lots of bright lights. What if we brought them all together? What if every drop of water, not that dams are good things necessarily, right? but what if we brought them all together and organized them? Yeah. What if our individual entities, individual organizations that are now in partnership, right? we all have partnerships to do our work, came together as a sector, came together to form a very powerful group of organizations that could really make change in the world, really shift the world. This is the Capitol in Washington, D.C. It's where a lot of lobbying right, or work on behalf of corporations goes on. We, as a sector of organizations working for public good, can come together and go to our governments and make things happen to support the work that we do whether it be incentives, right, or lobbying efforts, et cetera. We should get smart, right, and come together and do what corporations have learned to do very effectively. And we don't often do that because many of us are in the nonprofit sector. Let's change that. Just focusing on the pharmaceutical sector, can we really change the pharmaceutical sector? We smile, we already have. In the past, we've given birth to a generics industry because the cost of patented medicines was too high. Right? Did the pharmaceutical industry survive? It certainly did. It went on to become more powerful than it ever has been. Because of new technologies, new ways of doing science that were more biologically focused versus chemically focused, we've also given birth to a biotechnology industry. So can we change the pharmaceutical industry? Yes, we have. Isn't this beautiful? a heart of rice. So what is essential for transformation, for this transformation to occur? We need new investors, social investors, and new philanthropists like we talked about. We need consumers and patients and their families to demand products that are socially beneficial or priced 
so that access to medicines is ubiquitous. We need legislation and incentives to help us move beyond our nonprofit or academic situation and state into very powerful, right? but powerful in a different way, socially regenerative, socially changing organizations. And because the pharmaceutical industry retains almost all of the skill set around developing new medicines, we need to engage the pharmaceutical industry. And can that really be done? We need to remember, uh, I came from the pharmaceutical industry. And people within the pharmaceutical industry are individuals like us. They're looking for that fulfillment. They're looking for what's missing in the work that they do. Right? And tapping the energy within individuals, within pharmaceutical companies, is very, very, very possible. So what are the principles that I've followed in the work that, that I've done? Again, we were asked to present this to you. Not too many words, mostly slides, images. Fairness. If I were to choose one word, it's in making medicines and making medicines available. Fairness is so important here. People are born where they're born and develop the diseases they develop, and many of them are curable or treatable. And we should, out of fairness, do what we can to treat these diseases. This is a journey. This doesn't happen with one medicine. It doesn't happen with one disease. This is a journey that goes on for decades, and it's a journey of bringing people together who are disparate, who are different. You need to endure. Trust. Trusting people who are not like yourselves, trusting big corporations, trusting governments, trusting ministers of health, but also trusting the universe in a bigger sense, that we're on the right path, or that if we ask, we'll receive the guidance and direction that we need to change paths. Courage. Courage in the sense of bravery, to do things that have not been done before. But more than that, courage to do what we know to be right, whether someone has done it before or not. Being brave is one thing, but being courageous and doing work simply because it's the right thing to do is what we're talking about. Wisdom and knowledge of those who've come before us. Right? How to bring this forward, how to learn from those who've succeeded and those who've failed. Take learnings from health, understanding that health is not about pharmaceuticals. When you've worked through all of the other holistic ways of healing and you're sick and you need a medicine, you're at the end of the road, right? Having society understand that health is not just about medicines, okay? It's about an inner way of being, and it's about taking care of your body and taking care of society. Coming together, okay, convergence or cooperation. We have in the pharmaceutical industry quite a different principle, and it is that of competition. Okay? It's hard to do this work, and there is no need to compete when we want to benefit the public sector. We can come together. And let's be disruptive. If we're coming together to leave our regular work, to work for social benefit, let's aim high in our goals and change systems. What are obstacles and challenges along the road? The biggest obstacle is sometimes right here, is sometimes within ourselves. Our belief that a certain outcome is not possible our belief that there is not enough money, not enough resources to accomplish something. Our belief that I, as an individual, am not the person to lead. The obstacles can be here as well, in the heart, but often are here with intellect. An obstacle can be the belief in time. A belief that what we want to accomplish in our lives or in the world and the change that we want to have happen will take too long. There's not enough time or there's, it takes too much time. Okay? Time is relative. 
And things can move forward very quickly and time can shift when we're in alignment, right? With the universe and with other forces, with greater forces. So challenge your belief in time and how long something takes. Leaping. It's hard to find an image here of letting go of one trapeze bar right, before you grab the next or the hands of your partner. Right? You can't start something truly new, right? launch it and put all of your energy into it and increase the probability that you'll have success if you haven't let go of the old. Right? Many people, many social entrepreneurs who want to start businesses in the United States are in academia and they have beautiful hearts and they want to begin with a beautiful new science and apply it to benefit people in developing countries. And one of the problems with their plan is they want to remain a full-time professor in a university while they begin a new little business. And they wonder why they can't get investment. They can't get funding. And it's because you have to let go of right, your first job and move on to and dive fully, commit yourself completely to your new initiative and have faith in the world and in yourself. Decisions, many, many decisions daily mm -hmm. and how you make those decisions, whether you intellectually pursue them or intuitively pursue them, who you seek to help you make decisions are critical in the outcome. And let's not leave obstacles without talking about those dark days and nights, those difficult periods in life, those lonely parts of the journey right. where you need to get through. This is really spiritual work, right. spiritual darkness, that if you stay in it long enough and learn what you're supposed to learn there, reveals itself as light. So to not be afraid of these dark nights but to be there alone and stay, stay in it until it's done. I was also asked, what, are your challenge, what were your challenges as a woman in bringing this initiative forward? And I must say, it's, it's a little bit funny. Um, my challenge as a woman was that I was dismissed by male executives of pharmaceutical companies. One actually patted me on the head and said, okay, go ahead, young lady, and try to develop this nonprofit pharmaceutical sector. I met with four of them as I was starting One World Health. And I could have been upset by that, but I wasn't. I thought, I thought about it for a little while, and it really became clear to me that it was a blessing, that I had been dismissed and thought of as really nothing, as trivial. And now I could go and dive in deep and do the work that I needed to do. There's a saying, uh, uh, under the radar, okay? out of sight of radar, and do the work that I needed to do and come back later unnoticed. And that's what I did. So being dismissed okay, is not a bad thing. It means you're freer. It is a type of freedom. Yeah? Does that make sense? Eventually, we break through our walls, our obstacles. So to keep trying and not give up until we do. The solution and the reason or what you need to do to break through the wall may be different in the end than what you think it is in the beginning. So be willing to change your mind and your heart with regard to breaking through. What is success? What does it look like? For me, Social benefit in the pharmaceutical sector becomes the new standard. That to be a pharmaceutical company that no longer does significant social work means that no one wants to buy your products. That's the new standard. Success means there are many, many new medicines which are not being developed right now, whether they be for diseases of global poverty or rare and orphan diseases. It means financially viable hybrid companies that are not dependent on classic philanthropy. These are not charities or nonprofit organizations. Some can be, but not all. There is also a shift in what is leadership and how do we define leadership within the pharmaceutical sector. So to finish up now, 
There is a lot of turbulence in the world, if you choose to see it like that. We can call it chaos. And there's a lot to be frightened of. But if we simply put on a new lens, if we see differently, or if perhaps we close our eyes completely and listen with our other senses, or go beyond our five senses and perceive in another way, then what appears to be chaos up close at a distance is it's quite organized, it's quite powerful, it's quite beautiful, and it's quite natural. And it really is very beautiful. There is no difference between this wave, this hurricane, and this beautiful glass swirl. They're all the same. It's how we view them. It's the lens that we have. It's the obstacle that is within our mind or our heart that makes them look different to us. And it's all about moving toward consciousness together. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you.